um, carry out a qualitative quantum analysis with regard to those different sets of studies and in order to answer the following three questions. Which core assumptions dominated the foresight studies on the development of higher education teaching before 2020? What changes are emerging in the field of university teaching since the COVID-19 pandemic? And finally, which assumptions of the foresight studies on the development of teaching need to be revised in the, on the background of the um, developments uh, due to the pandemic? Which assumptions of the foresight studies have become more plausible and which less so? So here you can see quickly the um, a set of uh, foresight studies that we incorporated into our analysis. And on the next slide, you can have a quick view on the different um, surveys on uh, COVID-19 related um, consequences on university teaching that we uh, analyzed. And finally, this is a just quick impression of the different categories we use to analyze the texts, such as didactic quality, media competences and future skills, or study offer and additional offers. So what were the results of our um, analyses. Let's start with a few exemplary correspondences between the, the two types of different uh, studies. In the foresight studies that we had a closer look at, we saw that many of them said that online teaching would be gaining much more importance for higher education institutions. And that's exactly what we found uh, confirmed by the COVID-19 related studies, there was a significant increase, of course, for online teaching during the pandemic. Another such correspondence was that a lot of foresight studies uh, stated that a combination of digital elements and classical face-to-face -face teaching may gain uh, intensely in importance and that from our point of view was also strongly confirmed by the COVID-19 related studies where the discussion, for instance, about hybrid teaching and uh, blended university models uh, can be reflected in as, as a model for future university development, for instance. A third point or aspect would be that uh, in the foresight studies, it was assumed that future skills should be taught uh, by the universities more strongly and uh, actually some of the COVID-19 related studies also stated that some universities see it as an obligation to teach future and digital skills and the teachers want to create an atmosphere conducive to helping learners acquire future skills. So these are some of uh, a number of correspondences that we found between those two types of different uh, studies. But let's also have a look at the differences that we could find between the, um, the future studies and the COVID-19 related studies. For instance, in the um, COVID-19 related studies, we found um, the impression that in order to create a broader acceptance for online teaching, the development of interactive and long-term sustainable didactic approaches for online teaching is needed. It was a stronger emphasis on this point than in the foresight studies. Then it was said that negative effects of remote teaching, such as could be seen in the early um, pandemic related semesters, as, such as overwork and lack of exercise, should be prevented through differentiated and advanced didactic approaches in digital teaching. So, from the overall results, we can conclude that despite the successful rapid conversion to digital teaching in the pandemic semesters, universities still have a long way to go since digital transformation affects the entire institutions and their contexts. Generally speaking, it is apparent that many detailed solutions, overarching and integrating approaches are still missing. The new models of universities prophesied by the foresight studies are somewhat premature against the backdrop of the given time horizon. Thank you very much for this brief um, wrap up, for your attention, of course, for instance, particularly. Thank you very much, and thank you for sticking to the uh, The next speaker or the next session is called Fostering the Intercultural Competence of Future Teachers. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I would uh, wait a second. 
just trying to find the presentation. Uh, it seems to be escaping every time I try to bring it up. Uh, okay. Hmm. Was here during the checkup? It isn't now. Um, Rasmus, um, what should we do? I could do it without the presentation, or uh, another person yeah, could start that. Then, if you have it on your computer, you can share screen. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to do that. It's just uh, it's not able to find uh, the the tab. Which is weird because it worked when we uh, yeah when it we worked just a uh, few minutes ago yeah I could uh, I could do it without the presentation or somebody else uh, could start and then I maybe might... we can start with the next presentation well let's see if you great. can uh, find I'll it the next presentation is called five takeaways from teaching in virtual reality. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me and you can see me clearly. Uh, my name is David and I'm happy to be presenting here today five key takeaways that we gained when we were teaching in production and logistics module last summer term where we decided we want to teach in virtual reality instead of teaching in Zoom uh, because we obviously we had to teach online. Now, everyone was wearing uh, headsets, uh, VR headsets or joining from a computer and this would be what the application would be looking like. So the students were represented as avatars. You could see me standing there, for instance, on, on the stage, presenting some slides. We would be interacting. I could be asking questions. People could be um, giving feedback. They could be answering there. We could have smaller groups and, and uh, interact quite dynamically. So this is basically the setup that we've uh, had and uh, that, that we've been applying last semester. Now, uh, I want to present five key takeaways from that. And my first one is that it's a really positive one, right? VR offers some unique um, opportunities that are new and that are actually going beyond of what you can do when you're teaching with Zoom or Teams, something that we've been doing uh, previously as well. So what I really like is being presented as avatars. Everyone is physically there. It's no more that switch off computer or just the name, uh, as we've seen staring at Zoom. Uh, I guess we all have shared this. And so this is pretty cool. Um, I really like that you can draw something on whiteboards. It's very interactive, very dynamic. It's almost as if it was a classroom. There's some spatial audio that people standing next to you with their avatars, they are louder than someone very distant. And that's pretty cool because that really enables you to work in small groups very dynamically without having to go formally into breakout rooms and assigning them. So there's actually a lot about this um, to like, and I really enjoyed teaching it this way. But there are also four uh, further takeaways that I would like to share because they, they kind of indicate that there's more than just saying everyone uses the VR now. Um, and the second one, the second key takeaway is basically that it requires a new didactical approach. Now, what I mean by that, I used to teach uh, my, my four SWS, I used to teach um, on one day, 90 minutes plus 90 minutes. I found this very helpful to, to dive deeper into it. With VR, that doesn't really work because with VR, everyone has to wear those headsets and this is a lot of burn. So I moved over to teaching 45 minutes, 45 minutes and 90 minutes. That required quite a adjustment of, of the lecture and the content. Um, and in, when talk about the technical approach, it definitely doesn't work with this format that you are talking and people are listening just, it really is only working with interaction, right? So having them engage in small groups, this is what really works and this is what you really need to focus your, your didactical approach around. Third, technology exam should not be underestimated even for open-minded uh, students. And that was very, um, very important for me uh, to learn. We, we do have um, at uh, our Technical University of Munich campus in Heilbronn, we do have very open-minded students when it comes to technology. And yet it was in some cases that there were problems and the question was, you know, why do we need to go for VR? Why can't we go just for Zoom? Zoom has been working. Why do we need to try something new? Eventually it worked, though there have been updates from every now and then, which made it a bit more difficult. But overall it worked well, but you should not underestimate it. You should not take it for granted. And we had to put in a lot of work at the very beginning to get everyone up to speed and on board. Fourth, um, alternating uh, learning uh, become, paths becomes key. 
Um, what do I mean by that? So it's not just that you can say, now we go to VR and we just do the lecture as we would do in the classroom. One-on-one -on -one converting it, that was kind of my hope, but it doesn't really work. Why? Because for some, there's some nausea. They can't really spend too much time in VR. Even those that go to computer, they might feel it's a bit more difficult to follow. Um, and, and there are many other reasons why just going to, to VR doesn't work. And so what we did is we created over 80 video clips um, with all the content as well for those who prefer going this path. We had over 200 questions on Moodle that people could go through. And we had some additional exercise that we offered this term um, so that we could deal with those who don't, you know, don't, don't appreciate too much um, studying with VR or have some, some other issues there. And finally, VR can be fun, but it can also be exhausting, right? When you have your headset on for 90 minutes, if you teach multiple classes uh, on one day for different students, of course, then it can be quite uh, exhausting. And that's also something to, to keep in mind. Now, with that, I would like to conclude my five ticket teaching uh, key takeaways from teaching in uh, virtual reality. And I hope to stay in touch, to stay connected. Um, please feel free to reach out even after the session. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk here today. Thank you very much. Let's go back and see if we can find the presentation vis-a-vis -vis fostering the intercultural competence of future teachers. Does it work, yeah. Christoph? Let me try now, and uh, I think we are lucky this time. Okay. You should see something, I hope. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Fantastic. Okay, I'm not going to put it full screen because this didn't work uh, the other, other time. Um, thanks for being here, and apologies on behalf of uh, Professor Jutta Standop. Uh, she had an emergency case, and she couldn't attend today. Um, but I am going to talk about our project vis-a-vis. This project is a collaboration between three teacher seminars in Bonn, Haifa, and uh, Linz on the topic of interculturality, um, which is becoming more and more important uh, in teachers' lives. Um, it is basically a four-week online blog, which we integrated in our three pre-service teacher bachelor seminars in those three countries um, and three universities. The intention was to foster uh, intercultural competence in future teachers, um, to also foster their technology acceptance and overall their democratic competencies for a 21st uh, century. Um, we do this basically by problem-based learning, so it's a case-based approach. Um, the students mainly work in tri-national small groups um, and they work on a problem case which also deals with interculturality so you've got this mirroring of the interculturality factor it's uh, it's uh, the content of what they are learning uh, via the case story but it's also the way they approach it because their group work is uh, intercultural as well and uh, this way we have a synergy of this problem-based learning approach, the computer-supported uh, collaborative learning approach and the interculturality. Um, the project looks like this. It's, uh, as I said, four weeks. Uh, in the first week, we have an organizational meeting via Zoom. And uh, we used to do this project even before Corona. So um, this is uh, something which we could, could build on, uh, on. And now everybody uh, basically uh, knows the game and knows how it goes. Um, but uh, we had to start like uh, from the beginning in, in earlier years. And uh, we started with a Zoom conference um, on organizational matters. Um, then uh, we put people into tri-national intercultural groups and um, they uh, approached the case story on uh, an intercultural problem case from a school and uh, they identified knowledge gaps which uh, they as a group had and things which they needed to, uh, to know to be able to better solve this story or to be able to better make sense of the story and they uh, tried to filling in those gaps um, in the self-study phase which is also a traditional problem-based learning um, approach and after the self-study phase there was a second group work where um, everybody uh, brought together their expanded knowledge and the case uh, based discussion proceeded to hopefully uh, another and higher level and then 
we had a closing conference, which was again, everybody from all the uh, three countries together, roughly uh, 100 people uh, with group presentations on the individual solutions and a big farewell. The empirical results um, over the years were that um, First of all, we uh, we found out that the students considered this learning opportunity, which um, we designed as a democratic academic experience, something which of course was very important um, to us. And uh, after that, we examined whether the competencies we wanted to foster were actually fostered by this uh, intervention. And we measured their intercultural competence before and after the intervention and found out that it improved. Um, we did this uh, via a, uh, answers, answers on the scale um, the students gave us and via the analysis of uh, learning journals they fill in during uh, the group work. And we also found out that the technology acceptance of the particip participants has increased um, after our intervention. And First of all, we'd like to thank you very much for um, listening to our presentation. And um, if you like what we are doing, and uh, if you want to uh, want to join, um, especially international uh, potential uh, potential collaborators, we are always happy to expand our uh, our project. And yeah, or maybe you know somebody uh, who could be interested just uh, shoot them a message and tell them about us. Um, we are looking to expand this project. And yeah, this is our literature. Thanks again. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. OK, thank you very much. The last presentation is called Data Ethics and Stewardship in International Higher Education. And after that, there'll be a little bit of time for questions and answers. If you have questions, you can write them in the chat. Someone did already. So please go ahead, Nicolo. Hi, everybody. You should be able to see me and possibly even my presentation if everything is working correctly. Thanks for letting me know. OK, so let me just move around. So I'm Nicola Bonato. I work with the UF, the European University Foundation, and I'm a policy and research officer. Now, today I wanted to talk with you about data ethics and uh, ethical data stewardship, which is a topic that's very close to our hearts, of course. But we don't have much time, so it might be appropriate to start by asking ourselves what data ethics means and what it is. So data ethics is a branch of ethics that deals with the moral concerns related to data collection, usage, and uh, analysis. It uh, should inform the definition of purposes and boundaries for the collection and analysis of data. Now, if the word purposes uh, brings something to your mind, it might be the GDPR, because that regulation stresses a lot the word and the concept of purposes, so collecting data for a specific purpose. But of course, a key element of all this work is defining clear boundaries that go beyond mere regulatory compliance. For example, at the UF, we've been very involved in the rollout of a European student identifier, which is something that has many applications in the domain of student mobility. However, we've been really strict in scoping the usage only to academic systems so that no commercial uh, actors can, can interact with it by design to avoid sharing even more data than we would want to. So while the concept of data ethics is I hope quite intuitive, that of stewardship might be a bit more difficult because this is a new role, if we want to say it that way, in data governance. Uh, data stewardship is concerned with the management and the oversight of data in an organization. Now, a single organization, in our case, uh, an institution, a university, might not have a specific person appointed as a, a data steward. Uh, only basically because of staff concern, for example, but they will have somebody that takes at least part of those responsibilities on themselves. Data stewards are tasked with uh, making sure that the data collected and used by an organization is of a good quality, which is a word that might take on a different uh, practical implications depending on the final user of the data. But ultimately it means that the data is easily, be easily reusable, it's accessible, and interoperable between users and systems. Basically, part of their role is making sure that the university does not end up at the end of the year with like an Excel file, a Word document, and then a PDF file that all have like a portion of the list of incoming students. And then somebody somehow has to make a collage of all this information to try and come up with a full list. 
checking data safety and usage are two other main areas of concern for a data steward. And in this case, the steward takes, if you want, a somewhat executive role to the legislative counterpart of institutional data policies. Uh, I mentioned the idea of data ethics informing boundaries and purposes of data collection and usage. And of course, data stewards take part in that conversation. But more importantly, they have to make sure that what's decided in the data policy of an institution is an actually implemented. Now, moving into the topic of our, uh, of our chat, so data in higher education, uh, let me try and give you more uh, accurate examples. Now, we know that higher education institutions collect a lot of data coming from different topics and different sources. Uh, for example, research data, administrative data, personal data, both from students and staff. And one subset of data that is, of course, of particular interest for us at the European University Foundation is the data set of, on international mobility. Now, the ongoing digitalization of the Erasmus program means that even more data is collected uh, in easily accessible and usable formats. This opens the door to an array of possibilities. Of course, the first one that most might think about is the chance of getting rid or at least simplifying bureaucracy by switching from the exchange of paper or PDF documents to that of data, which is uh, faster, faster, easier to read and to maintain. But it also allows institutions to use the data they collect to help students. Uh, one practical example is with the digitalization of learning agreements. For, for example, an institution might use this, so the data that's more easily accessible to just exchanging scanned PDFs, to see that, let's say that one course is very commonly picked by students that are incoming students, but then when they come to your institution, they switch away to other courses. And you might wonder, okay, you see this trend in the data, and you see that many students, okay, pick this course, but then don't end up concluding it. And you might come to the conclusion, that, for example, I don't know, um, it's too hard for non-native speakers, or maybe the syllabus of the course is not reflective enough of what's actually the topic. And so you might want to change that to help students. And uh, of course, data might help you hone in into a single problem. Now, for larger universities, another possible avenue opened by keeping all data easy to handle, which is part of the job of the data steward, is that of automated decision making. Now, this might sound like a buzzword to some of you, or maybe sci-fi to others, but to be quite uh, grounded, let me give you a real-world example. So before working with the UF, I was actually a student worker in uh, my university, and we had to deal with uh, uh, many tasks in the Erasmus Coordination Office. One of the tasks was making sure that students with learning agreements uh, followed rules set by uh, departments and the university um, to choose classes. And this was pretty much following a large data set of rules and then making sure that learning agreements were compliant with those rules. This is clearly a task right for automation because it's a repetitive and well-defined task. And automation in this context would then mean the students might, for example, get a, a warning when their learning agreement is not following those rules or might even be prevented uh, to make those cho choices that would then trigger a warning telling them that they have to make some changes inevitably. Here, the data steward would have to do quite a lot of work because they would want to make sure that the automated process is clearly communicated and everybody knows that it is an automated process and that there is full transparency on the rules that are employed. There are also clear pathways for appeal, so to speak, so students can appeal if they think that the decision was wrong and also that potential pitfalls are accounted for and uh, fixed if they can be fixed by the AT department colleagues. Now these are just simple examples but hopefully they shine a light on what's possible and what might be going on in the professional environment around us. Data stewardship and ethics play an important role in higher education because they ensure that only useful and necessary data uh, Hello, uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, could you wrap up, uh, please? I think you... Yeah, yeah, sorry. This was uh, my last uh, my last one. One or two uh, questions. Uh, so they ensure that only useful and necessary data is collected and they prevent uh, data hoarding, which is one of the problems where we might have. We come in with more data than what we need. And so we would just encourage you to think creatively about data and how they can help both IRO do their jobs and students have a better experience. Uh, we do have a couple of more minutes. There is one question in the chat. Uh, is there a specific platform that was used in order to create these uh, visuals? I think the question is for David. Would you like to respond to that? 
Yes, hi. So thank you very much for that question. Um, I assume you're referring to the visuals uh, that, I, that I showed like um, this, right? Um, so this was indeed a platform that we did not create, but we, we got a license. Um, it's called, and I really don't want to make advertising for that forum, but it's called Engage. If you search for Engage VR, um, they offer this, um, yeah. And, and, and you can use it then um, and test it also, a version of it. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, there's one more question for you. Uh, why didn't you include a country that is part of the developing nations? Uh, oh, no, sorry, that's not a question for you. I guess that's a question for uh, Christoph. Uh, you speak about inclusion, but on the other side, you bring in awareness to already privileged students. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the question, first of all. And uh, it's actually, it's a coincidence that we are uh, those three countries now. Um, it's uh, We would be happy to have uh, developing uh, nations as well taking part in it. And if you can... Uh, spread the word uh, and uh, get us into contact with uh, with some interesting universities. We would be more than happy. We are into con in contact with an Egyptian university at the moment. Um, yeah, it's just this this whole project. It's uh, uh, it's quite quite a hassle to find uh, find people who want to collaborate. Uh, collaborate. Uh, at least it was in the beginning because it's also risky for for the lecturers. Uh, they didn't know what we are doing. Whether the, those would be f lost for weeks or whether we we were actually up to uh, delivering a good project. Now we have uh, have all those uh, um, conference attendances and. Um, our, our publications and everything, uh, and people can be sure that we are not just, uh, uh, they can be sure that we know what we are doing, but before they couldn't, so it wasn't easy at all to find anybody. Um, and uh, yeah, those were the first first countries um, we could get in contact with, but we are very happy to expand um, our, our reach and uh, we are actively uh, seeking to do so. Thank you. And I think the last question will be this one from Susanne of Deutsch. Welche Hersteller für VR Brillen kann man empfehlen? Yeah. <laughs> Let me still answer in English if that's okay. Um, because I'm English speaking here. So what 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 uh VR uh, producer would you recommend? So that's one thing, um, and that's Oculus is pretty strong, but Oculus is Facebook. And so Oculus 2 would enforce each student to accept using Facebook with an account and it's very difficult to get them in Germany. So um, they are in, in terms of price and performance, I would say they are top, but in terms of data um, compliance, it's very tricky. Uh, I would say if you look for um, Pico Neo um, too, they are working pretty well. Um, they don't have this issue. They are also good and, and Pico Neo 2 or 3 would be something to look into um, if you need standalone versions. Um, but it really depends. There are also good ways of uh, using your, your smartphone and putting it into a cardboard box. Probably the cheapest version um, that's out there to use that. It really depends on the application. And um, if you like, uh, Susanna, I'm happy to, to um, talk more with you about this because um, I think this is running over time otherwise. Um, but it's a really good point, and we've been spending quite some time on thinking about which we are classes to use. Last question. Then thank you very much to the speakers, to Klaus, Christoph, David, and Nicolo. Uh, that's the end of the session. Also, thank you to all the participants for joining. As you know, there are more sessions coming up during this afternoon, evening, and tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, have a look at the program if you're interested in more sessions. So thank you again for listening and have a nice day. <laughs>